All right, I think we are live. So welcome everybody, thanks for joining me again. This is Dr. Kelton uh, from uh, Osteopathic Wellness Medicine, <clears> Home <throat> Integrative Practice. We're gonna discuss regenerative medicine applications for hips and knees today, uh, but on a wider kind of spectrum, this applies to pretty much any any body part um, where the regenerative medicine can be of great, great usefulness. Just as an introduction, uh, I'm an owner of a integrated wellness practice that focuses on helping the body heal naturally. Uh, we use um, regenerative medicine uh, techniques, including stem cells and platelets, to help uh, arthritic joints, problems with the spine. We also have intravenous infusions that help with optimization of metabolic functions, reduction of inflammation. Uh, we do hormone optimization in women's health. So really kind of a very, very broad spectrum uh, practice that's very, that just seeks to uh, offer a natural comprehensive wellness approach to an individual, uh, all done in a very comfortable, comfortable setting with just a lot of, a lot of attention paid to details and uh, each individual's, um, you know, uh, comfort level. So that's just a very brief introduction. I want to kind of jump into the, um, into the, the PowerPoint discussion. Uh, and then please, uh, at the end, uh, I'd love some questions if you guys have them. Um, and, uh, here we go. Okay, so first and foremost, let's talk about what regenerative medicine is. Regenerative medicine is basically a, a study, a field of medicine that focuses on helping restore function to injured uh, or diseased tissue. Uh, it is uh, applicable to joints, cartilage, it's applicable to nerves, uh, tendons, ligaments, and even organs. So in my field of, of expertise, it's all about peripheral structures like joints and cartilage and ligaments and nerves, but there's a lot of research going on on regenerative medicine for organs, uh, brain and spinal cord injuries, etc. <clears throat> so kind of a white, white, white field that's rapidly growing and advancing. Just to give you a background of regenerative medicine, it kind of started with the study of and the and the and the um, discipline of prolotherapy. If you look at the timeline, the prolotherapy timeline goes quite a ways back, starting in the 1830s, and uh, at that point, general surgeons were using dextrose and the alcohol solution to repair hernias. In 1930s, there was an osteopathic physician who actually uh, injured his own thumb had a lot of looseness in the thumb and finally figured out that he could fix his ligament that was torn by injection of dextrose or prolotherapy and actually was the first person to coin the term ligamentous hypolaxity or hypermobile joint. So this hypermobility is the key to this whole discussion because the hypermobility is in essence a the kind of the root cause of chronic pain and dysfunction. We know that we can improve things that don't move well enough. We know that we can go to a massage therapist, physical therapist, chiropractor, and if something's not moving, those professionals can help us get that area moving better. <clears throat> but what happens when something's moving too much? There's really not a lot of, um, you know, resource and the, the, there, there are not a lot of answers to something that's moving excessively. In comes in, prolotherapy. So in 1950s, Dr. Hackett, who was a general surgeon by trade, um, found that when he would inject dextro solution in the areas that he repaired surgically, it would heal faster. And then ultimately, actually, as he got older, uh, he started to use prolotherapy exclusively, even in lieu of surgery in a lot of areas, to again promote this natural repair. In the 60s, he was joined by internal medicine doctor, Dr. Hamill, and together they formed a Prolotherapy Association and actually founded a school that's still in medicine, Wisconsin, um, that teaches folks prolotherapy techniques. The big contribution that they made was not just in the fact that prolotherapy was a natural healing substance that can help the body repair without 
surgical intervention, but also in this understanding that there is a stability component that's very important <clears throat> that is lost during this laxity that in, in a lot of uh, situations is the root cause of dysfunction and pain. So not only are you regenerating an injured area, but you're actually a re creating stability of a structure that's been damaged. Very, very important concept. So just to give you kind of a, a quick breath of how many places can have breakdown of that stability of those ligament or tendon attachments, all of the black spots on the skeleton are those attachment points and they actually literally are all and can all be injected to restore stability and strength. So just it gives you a sense of how many areas can be treated with regenerative medication, medicine and prolotherapy in particular. <clears throat> so at the root of this instability or this injury is this uh, anatomical construct called the anthesis. The anthesis is actually the anchor point. Those are the black spots you saw in the skeleton where the ligament or the muscle attaches to the skeleton. Okay. And at that point, there's frequently a breakdown uh, with trauma or repetitive stress. So the anthesis is where the anchoring happens. The anthesis damage is where the looseness occurs. <clears throat> now, what's interesting is that some stress, and this is what that diagram is showing, is very important to maintain good health of these attachment points. They actually need a little bit of strain to continuously repair, which the body, of course, always does, and maintain good resilience. However, if the load or the strain exceeds the body's ability to repair naturally, you're going to have breakdown occur, and eventually breakdown will lead into tear, which again leads to this hypermobility, hypermobility, just like I kind of mentioned before. So this leads me to the next concept called tensegrity. Tensegrity is an architectural term that combines two words, tension and integrity, and basically explains how we are able to maintain stability in our skeleton. <clears throat> if you look at the photographs on the left side of the slide, the, the bottom picture shows these gigantic beams kind of floating in midair, seemingly suspended. Um, but there, if you look closely, that you see that they're suspended by cables. And these cables, by creating even tension on the beam, create that balance. If you look at the picture above, the blue structures are our ligaments. And you see how they're pulling evenly in both directions creating that very similar phenomenon of tension, integrity, or stability through tension. Imagine if one of those ligaments goes, or one of the cables goes in this in this sculpture below, <clears throat> everything will start to kind of shift and twist, creating strain and stress and then pain and dysfunction. So let's move on and talk about other types of regenerative medicine. We talked about prolotherapy, I mentioned that it's primarily a solution of dextrose, which is a naturally healing uh, substance that has a lot of healing properties. Uh, it's also a mild stimulant, uh, which then, um, when it's injected, actually creates this mild irritation, which then causes the body to start paying attention to that area, recognize it as an injured area, and then ultimately then repair it. But in cases with more advanced breakdown, prolotherapy or dextrose is not strong enough, so we usually will go to platelet-rich plasma. Platelet-rich plasma is a very um, powerful solution of growth factors that direct, that's uh, actually obtained from your blood. And if we need something even stronger yet, we would go to stem cell therapy. Uh, again, uh, typically derived from the body, but also uh, can be obtained from from other sources and uh, concentrated, purified in the lab environment. So let's let's talk about PRP. Here's a picture of a, of a container of concentrated and spun PRP. The yellow is the clear plasma. And on the bottom of that yellow container, the yellow compartment, there's a stripe of red and pink, and that's the PRP. So out of, let's say, 60 mLs of blood, 
you get that super concentrated amount of, of PRP, it's reconstituted back into some of the yellow solution, which is your clear plasma, and then that's injected into the tissues to promote repair and healing. <clears throat> so some of the applications for PRP, well, um, the uh, studies have shown that PRP is could be very anti-inflammatory. It, it has been shown to reduce inflammatory markers such as IL-17, not only in the joint, but also in the whole body, even if it's just a joint that's being injected, like in the case here of the knee arthritis. It's been shown to stabilize cartilage. There's a study that showed that when they followed folks with moderate arthritis by serial MRIs, so the MRIs that are done uh, repeatedly over a number of, number of months, uh, unlike people that did not get a PRP injection, where they did see cartilage pro loss progression, when they've injected these people with a single PRP treatment, it actually stopped a progression of cartilage loss for at least a year. Very, very, very uh, powerful study that really shows that this is a very, very, uh, you know, very effective treatment for these kind of problems. So it could be used in arthritic joints, as I discussed. It could be used in arthritis of the neck, mid back, and lower back. Any kind of arthritic problems of the pelvic joints. It's amazing for tendon tears, typically rotator cuff tears, unless they're full and complete tears can be repaired with PRP. It's great for ligament sprains and tears. Um, it's, I, I don't say it in here, but it's very effective for meniscal tears in the knee. Uh, it's effective for labral tears in the, in the shoulder. So all of these sports labral tears or slap tears as they're called, that are going under the knife 99% of them are not do not need to be repaired surgically. They can be repaired with PRP. And in my experience, two treatments, three or four weeks apart, will repair most of the smaller labral tears in the shoulder or the slap tears. It can also be used for aesthetics such as hair growth and even aerosolized in a more advanced treatments for things like chronic lung inflammatory conditions and even brain trauma. So the stem cells are gonna be stronger yet and they're the use for more advanced arthritis. These are the folks that are being told that, hey, you know, you need a joint replacement. A lot of times they'll come to me seeking an alternative. Frequently we'll talk about stem cells. The picture here shows an isolated uh, uh, fat. Uh, it's the pink orange layer right in the middle. Uh, it has a ton of stem cells in it and those are then actually reconstituted with PRP and then injected into the area of injury. Uh, stem cells can also be withdrawn from a person's iliac crest or hip bone. <clears throat> Those are very good as well, but they tend to lose potency as a person gets older. So frequently we'll, we'll kind of um, shift more towards the fat stem cells either after 70 years of age or if someone has really, really, really badly degenerated area that needs a stronger treatment, we'll, we'll, go, we'll go to fat stem cells at that point as well. So in the research, we're a little limited uh, because it's actually legal to study, um, to perform uh, stem cell research on humans. So we rely on um, <clears throat> uh, case studies and also on animal studies, I'll talk about in, in a little bit. But briefly, just to kind of mention what these stem cells, what a stem cell actually is, it's basically a progenitor cell. It's a cell that can generate into or become pretty much anything, anything in the body. And that's especially true in the fetus. And when we're still in the uterus, these stem cells are literally making our organs and everything else that we're made of. Now, as we are born and we start to mature, uh, fairly quickly, the stem cells switch to a uh, like an adult type of stem cell that still has an ability to regenerate but it's a smaller ability it's basically now has a limited capacity to form into like a ligament tendon muscle so it's still applied to musculoskeletal medicine but certainly won't develop into organs for instance we also have a more advanced understanding of what a stem cell actually does we know that only a very small portion of the stem cell function is actually then directly becoming a tissue, becoming an injured tissue or replacing an injured tissue. What most, uh, what the most uh, 
activity of the stem cell actually is, is it acts like a foreman on a construction job. So you're going to have your bricks, you're going to have your brick layers, <clears throat> but if there's no foreman, there's disorganization and, and the work is not being done of building, let's say, a house, right? Kind of like the cells building, um, using your nutrients, those are the bricks, uh, and the cells of the brick layers. Unless there's a foreman in the job, they will not know what to do and they will not generate a repair. So the stem cell comes in and it starts to orchestrate basically an organized process where the cells start to utilize these growth factors and, and nutrients to start actually generating repair and healing the injured area. Just a quick mention that there is a difference in the approaches, even the isolation of uh, stem cells. It's the same with PRP. If you, uh, if a clinic uses a cheap, a cheap kit that does not concentrate the stem cells enough, you see that example on the right, where it's kind of like this, you know, kind of a very diffuse uh, solution without distinctive layers, versus the a more advanced kit that shows distinct concentration and I and separation of different layers that allows us to really, really concentrate and pack a punch between, you know, with these stem cell injections when we put them into the injured area. From the standpoint of safety, it's considered to be a very safe procedure. One uh, study looked at 2,800 patients, uh, actually kind of aggregated from multiple studies and showed no adverse outcomes whatsoever. So that's saying a lot. You can't say that for even over-the-counter medicines. So just really something to kind of take home. And uh, from the standpoint of studies, again, because we can't really do human studies, we, we rely on case studies. And there's one, here's one example of a case study where we did, we pulled 61 of these studies and came up with 2,300 patients with osteoarthritis. And uh, this is from 2018. And the consensus from these studies was that the stem cells are indeed beneficial. There was definitely a clear evidence that they help people with osteoarthritis. The design was not superior because these were kind of compilations, but certainly the trend was very clear in a positive direction. <clears throat> a better study, I think, is a study of these race, uh, racing greyhounds that were retired, all with arthritis, and they used their hip stem cells and injected their own hip stem cells into the joints and 92 percent of the 130 dogs had significant improvement in pain and function only six percent improved slightly and two percent worsened this improvement was maintained for up to six months again fairly impressive numbers and of course this is from one injection okay and we typically do not just do one treatment we usually do a series of treatments to make sure that there's adequate and thorough repair uh, in the area that we're treating we also know just like, sim like, like PRP, stem cells can be very anti-inflammatory in nature. We know that they can reduce inflammation not only in the rheumatoid arthritic patients, but also in the osteoarthritic patients, which also have a lot of inflammation that it helps accelerate destruction of the joint. So, in, I'm just going to move on to the next slide here. Um, what are the uses of stem cells? Well, again, just like with PRP, arthritic joints are going to be one of the most common uses. Uh, again, we're going to we're going to really uh, save stem cells for people that have advanced osteoarthritis, for instance. Um, you can do a stem cell IV infusion for autoimmune disease, which could be very very anti-inflammatory. Generally, those are not derived from the body, but they're made in the lab and concentrated and purified. They're usually our placenta stem cells that we're using them for. Same for neurodegenerative conditions like Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis. More and more studies are being used, um, being done on benefits of um, exosomes, which are the types of stem cells that I'm talking about <clears throat> in those applications. It was actually was just approved a study of one of the main manufacturers of these kind of stem cells for COVID, which is amazing. So this is obviously in the study process, so stay tuned. But the fact that there was actually an approved study by the government says volumes about the potential benefits 
of these uh, stem cell products. The future of stem cells, there are some other <clears throat> methods that can be used to ensure that the stem cells are more viable that we get from the body especially. There's a like a light technique that can actually um, target healthier stem cells and then uh, what we do is we then isolate these stem cells and then inject them theoretically so you get a better crop of stem cells that are being injected into the body. The challenge there is that this is a very expensive technology and it's really not ready for prime time because of the cost. There's also a, uh, a genetic ability for us to turn a adult stem cell into a fetal stem cell, which can be anything, but the risk of doing that is creating a cancer cell because it divides so rapidly. So again, we know how to turn these cells on, but we don't know how to turn them off. So again, we're not quite ready for prime time yet. So from the standpoint of the clinical application, we use something called a classic Hackett and Hamwell approach. This is the approach where we're talking about using uh, this tensegrity as a concept of repairing and restoring function, not just injecting one, uh, one injection uh, into the joint to try to repair the whole thing. It tends to not work well if a person just get, gets a single injection into a joint that has arthritis. You're leaving a lot on the table. So not, this is uh, not a one and done approach at all. So I'll just mention a couple of areas. We'll, we'll talk about the hip specifically um, and again, it's a comprehensive approach with Heck and Hamill technique. Uh, I'm going to talk about a case study to start with. This is a 36 year old female who came in with bilateral avascular necrosis. This is when the bone loses blood supply and starts to die. Uh, typically, uh, really, um, a prescription for a hip replacement, but she was so young that we we're trying to avoid that process or at least delay it as much as possible. And she came to me for some alternatives. What was interesting is that, you know, <clears throat> she was very, very limited in her motion. There was a significant amount of pain. The MRI was very consistent. We're showing the subvascular necrosis. So although prognosis did not appear to be very favorable, she actually showed quite an astounding uh, improvement from the injections that we were doing for her. We started with PRP treatments and this is, goes way back now to 2017. There was a little bit of improvement in pain, but not enough <clears throat> to really make a huge difference. And we quickly went to bone marrow aspirate or bone marrow stem cells. Now, amazing, after the first treatment, she had 40% improvement in pain with walking, sitting and bending. She immediately reduced the use of pain pills, uh, but continued to still use them daily. She then came back again in January for a second one. And at that point, most of the sharp pain was completely gone. The pain felt more like pulling of the muscle. She was, little, she was able to walk with a much more natural gait and was actually able to sit cross-legged on the table. And this is how they greeted me when I came into the room. Amazing because before that she was waddling around, not being able to even sit comfortably with legs straight. We then followed up with just a booster treatment of PRP a couple of months later, and um, that allowed her to almost completely come off oxycodone and reduce significantly anti-inflammatories, and uh, really was doing quite well at last follow-up. So from the standpoint of the actual approach, this picture shows that we're treating the joint itself on the bottom and the ligaments. Again, there's your tensegrity. Again, these ligaments, uh, these white bands that you see on the picture above, they actually hold the joint in place. They do uh, stretch out with arthritis and they then cannot hold the joint in the, in, the, in the optimal position, which generates more friction pain and actually leads to more breakdown of cartilage. <clears throat> so we definitely want to treat that. We certainly want to inject inside the joint to help strengthen the cartilage of the joint that way as well. And we also want to inject the muscles. The muscles, of course, create a, a lot of the stability of the joint. The white of the muscle uh, and is the tendon. And the piece with the tendon that attaches to the bone is also that anthesis point, right? So that's the anchor point that loosens with time and can be 
uh, reinforced and strengthened with prolotherapy or platelets or stem cells. A lot of times we'll also even inject the bursa because frequently the bursa will get in inflamed when a person waddles around uh, trying to limp, limp or favor the leg <clears throat> because of hip arthritis. So we'll talk about the knee now. Um, Similar concept that we want the knee to be stable. It's not, it's not just about the cartilage repair. So here's an example of a 75 year old male, 10 year history of on and off left knee pain. When he saw an orthopedic surgeon that recommended a knee replacement, um, <clears throat> this is a while back, but most recently he presented with just significant worsening of this pain. Now what was interesting was that there was very little swelling in the joint where the problem was the joint felt unstable. So I think that there was some tear of a ligament that happened just over time because the joint had so much wear and tear. <clears throat> and indeed, the exam did show a lot of pain over medial collateral ligament, which probably had a little degenerative tear in it and some other attachment points as well. So when we started treating him, we focused a lot on the ligament stability. And we used a combination of dextrose and PRP. We used the comprehensive Hackett and Hamill approach where we treated the entire 360 aspect of the joint as well as an internal portion of the joint. And with these two treatments, his exam markedly improved. There was a lot less pain in all aspects of the knee. He had very little instability with stressor, stressor, the actual stress of the knee and the discomfort became very mild and intermittent. And his improvement was so great that he actually competed in his senior empire games and shot put and placed third, which is pretty amazing from somebody, you know, for somebody who earlier that year was told he needed a joint replacement. So as far as the approach to the knee, you see these white ligaments and tendon attachments that are surrounding the knee, creating this basket, we we'll call it a capsule. This is where a lot of the work is being done to restore stability. <clears throat> Those ligaments are also visible on the back end as well. And of course you have menisci that you see on the back, these round shoe, horseshoe structures that are treated frequently together with the ligaments because frequently also have some tears which contribute to pain and instability. We also treat the muscles of the knee. The muscles, again, are, can never be ignored. They create a huge amount of support for the joint and the attachments of the muscles can also be loosened and weakened and can be restored and regenerated with these treatments. <clears throat> now, the other thing that's interesting is that aside from the fact, just the fact that surgery can be ex overly aggressive for some of these problems, and may not resolve the issue and sometimes can certainly have complications that can make things worse. Of course, keeping in mind the fact that there are absolutely very clear cut cases when surgery is indicated. So there's, without a doubt, there is a definitely a case to be made for surgery, but there also is a very strong case to be made that there are very common cases where surgery is not indicated and is still being done and offered to patients. Aside from all of that, there's also growing evidence, starting with this study in 2019, but now even more literature available since I made this PowerPoint, of this cognitive impairment that I see seen in people after general anesthesia, especially with joint replacements, probably because in the joint replacement, the general anesthesia is longer than in some other surgeries is what I'm guessing. But in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease, they found that there was a 15% reduction of all brain functions in people uh, over age of 60. Uh, and the rate of this cognitive impairment was seen in about 23% of the people underwent the surgery. Now, I think that that's probably understated. The later studies that I've seen actually have shown a much higher percentage of people suffering from cognitive impairment after general anesthesia and not even for joint replacements for any general anesthesia. So again, it's starting to become more and more recognized as a potential risk and another reason to try to avoid general anesthesia 
uh, for surgery and try to repair with more natural holistic methods. So in conclusion, um, we talked about prolotherapy as kind of the granddaddy of all physical therapy, uh, of all regenerative medicine, rather. Uh, it's uh, primarily, um, it primarily utilizes dextrose and uh, it's used for mild injuries, mild impairment of the, of the joints. Uh, for more advanced degenerative processes, um, we use PRP or platelet-rich plasma. This is something that we draw from your vein. It's processed at the time of the visit. It's injected in and around the joint. It helps produce cartilage repair, meniscal repair, ligament and tendon repair. Uh, it reduces inflammation. Stem cells are going to be our strongest option, whether it's a lab-based stem cell or a stem cell derived from the body. It promotes cartilage repair. It's very, very good for end-stage osteoarthritic joints, the ones that people have been told they need replacements for. And it's also very anti-inflammatory. The fat seems to be more anti-inflammatory than the bone marrow ones. So I, that is kind of the end of the talk. It was a kind of a fast and furious presentation that covers all of the different aspects of, um, of regenerative medicine. I definitely uh, cut some corners here because of the length of time that's needed to go through the, deep, the topic, but I hope that gives you guys at least some um, knowledge to go off <clears throat> and talk to your friends or apply them to yourself if you're suffering from uh, you know, a degenerative arthritic condition. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them now. Uh, please feel free to go on our website. It has a lot of information, omeintegrativewellness.com, under regenerative medicine. <clears throat> uh, we're happy to uh, answer questions through email and phone calls as well. So if there are no questions, um, I wish you guys a great evening and happy holidays. Thanks for joining me tonight.